I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 112th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. When when people who I meet who don't know me through the podcast find out that I do a podcast, they almost always ask, hey, so what's your podcast about? And I've got this sort of ham-handed way of explaining it. I I say, well, it's about different things that a person could do to make oneself smarter. And and then I specify a little bit more. I say, well, even though we do some episodes about things like, you know, meditation or lucid dreaming or what have you, more often than not, it's about things that one puts in one's mouth to make oneself smarter. Thinking, of course, when I'm saying that, that I'm talking about nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, supplements, and I say, well, it's generally about pills, but this is an episode that straddles the gap in a weird way, because this actually is about something that you could put in your mouth that would affect your brain, but it's not about something you would eat, not about something you would digest, not even about something that you would swallow. This is an episode that was inspired by a conversation that I had a few weeks ago. This was back episode number 104. We were talking with with Professor Vincent Clark from the University of New Mexico about electroceuticals, and he he made an offhanded reference to a couple of orthodontists that he'd been in contact with that were actually using mouth-worn orthodontic appliances to have effects on patients with neurological conditions. And I said, what? It, it didn't, didn't sound reasonable. The two ideas did not connect in my mind. But Dr. Clark was not only very adamant about it, he was very excited. And so I asked for the contact information for the doctors in question. He put me in contact. And that's what this episode's going to be. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Anthony Sims and Dr. Gary Demergian, each of whom has sort of a more traditional practice, but in the past few years have been starting to work with orthodontic appliances to have effects on people that have chronic neurological conditions, things that you may have heard of like Tourette's syndrome or sleep apnea, and some far lesser known conditions as well, but ones that are extremely meaningful and problematic to the people that are afflicted with them. This is going to be an out there episode. It's it's really kind of counterintuitive how misalignments of the jaw, tweaking the positioning of nerve endings within the jaw can have effects all over the body and, and most importantly in the functioning of the brain and once again we're faced with an episode that shows no respect to the idea of mind-body duality but really shows that we are all one package anyway that'll be in the main interview if you hang around until the very end of the episode even though getting distracted is typically thought of as a negative thing something that we try to avoid there's actually some significant upside to distraction in certain cases so find out about how to optimize your distraction in the ruthless listener retention gimmick but as usual now let's kick things off with this week in neuroscience Science. Smart Drug Smarts, this week in neuroscience. So here's a little piece of neuroscience news that I was, I, I must admit, a, a little bit happy to read in the schadenfreude sense. Not necessarily that I'm, I'm wishing ill on people who can read faster than me, but that all of us, I'm sure, come across advertisements for speed reading materials, classes, technologies that promise some truly fantastic gains. And many of us have probably tried our hands with these things from time to time that can, if you believe the hype, double, triple, even quintuple or beyond the amount of word input that you can get per minute with little or no real loss in comprehension. It takes some training. You've got to get the system down. You've got to retrain the way that your eye moves across the page. In some systems, it's taking in larger blocks of words at one time in one unit. In some of the technological solutions that have come out in the past couple of years, instead you see words just thrown at you at one point on a screen with increasing rapidity. So you're not having to move your eye at all. You just stare at one point and words are just sprayed at you rapid fire at whatever whatever rate you say that you can accept. And I've, I've tried these things from time to time and I've always come away thinking that, well, yeah, I did get down a lot more words, more quickly, but I'm always left with the sneaking suspicion that I I probably didn't actually capture the information. I wasn't able to process it as well. I probably wouldn't have the recall or the real understanding that I would if I had been reading at my normal rate. And so it was with somewhat of a sigh of relief that I came across this paper in the recent Association for Psychological Science journal entitled So Much to Read, So Little Time, How Do We Read and Can Speed Reading Help? And in this paper, we'll link to the paper, the entire paper is actually available for free on the web, but the gist of it is no. Most of the claims of being able to double or triple reading speed with no real loss in comprehension. It just doesn't bear up under real world testing. Most of the time when somebody's able to read something at an incredible speed and show strong comprehension, it tends to be in a subject that they already have
have significant background knowledge in. And what speed reading really seems to be doing in a lot of cases is giving people exceptional skill in skimming text. Not really fully reading it, but skimming for high level topics and concepts is a style of reading, a style of knowledge acquisition that can certainly be useful, but it tends to rely on having a pretty good background knowledge. So you sort of know what the important points are. You grab those ones and your brain daisy chains those together. But if you're starting from ground zero on a topic, it, skimming really isn't that effective. So the overall takeaway from this article is that the technologies that avoid your having to move your eyes where you just sort of stare at one point, those can have some benefits, but they're, they're limited because the majority of the time that we spend reading really is about language processing. It's not about moving the eyes. And if you want to get the gist of something in a domain where you already have some good background knowledge, then speed reading systems can be really, really helpful for that. But probably not so much for ground level learning where you really do want to think about the ideas as they're coming to you and not just skip to the high points. And then last but not least, probably the most effective way to increase your real reading with comprehension speed is get ready to groan. Simply practice makes perfect and doing more reading. As people read more, there are less words that will be unfamiliar to them. You'll be growing your reading vocabulary so your brain won't have to sort of slow down for these speed bumps of unfamiliar words. And reading in certain styles of text, like an academic textbook, sort of has a different cadence to it than a comic book or literary fiction or whatever. And getting your brain primed to know what to expect in the rest of the sentence that you're in the process of reading, that does seem to have some real benefits for reading speed. So it's not the speed reading technologies are worthless tools, it's just that it is best to think of them as tools and you don't want to use the same tool for all jobs. Smart Drug Smarts. The podcast so smart, we have smart in our title. Twice. So as usual, a big thank you to everybody that reached out over the course of this week. I, I think I found out about our audience that we are more interested in robots, apparently, than we are about dolphins. I don't think anybody got back in touch about that thing from a couple of weeks ago that was at least news to me that dolphins can sleep with half of their brain at one time, which I thought was amazing. But a lot of people seem to be pretty intrigued by last week's ruthless listener retention gimmick about Roko's basilisk. Luckily, so far as I can tell, none of you had the willies scared out of you by that. But either way, I'm glad that was an intellectually captivating idea for people worthy of at least a couple of late night discussions from the sounds of it. Apparently, by the way, again, according to internet legend, the originator of that idea, Rocco, when asked how to handle anxiety that that idea could cause, his answer was to go buy a lottery ticket. I guess he thinks that the negative chances of having something horrible happen to you from the uh, arrival and breakout of Rocco's Basilisk is just about as likely as your chances of winning a lottery ticket should you happen to buy one. So you can buy a lottery ticket and get your overall odds stacked back to zero. We've been doing a bit of house cleaning over at smartdrugsmarts.com. Not quite finished yet, but if you've been seeing things kind of seismically shifting over the course of the week, wondering where some familiar pages are going and things of that nature, well, nothing to worry about. Just a little nipping and tucking and spring cleaning in advance of some new things that we're planning on adding to the website in coming weeks. I will no doubt be talking about that more soon. If you want an early warning system on all things Smart Drug Smarts, I invite you to sign up for our newsletter. You can get on that list by going to smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter and signing up. It is simple, fast, fun. It will not require any speed reading to get that read in a finite amount of time. And I'll let you know the latest, not just of what we're doing on the show, what we've got coming up, but also of what we're feeding our brains to come up with some of the concepts that we cover here. And for literally feeding our brains, we've got a couple of supplement stacks, as you probably know, over on the web at axonlabs.io. You can also get there by going to smartdrugsmarts.com and clicking on the shop link and see the kind of cognitive candy that we've got in little Pez dispensers around the office here at Smart Drug Smarts. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, so as mentioned, we're going to be talking with a couple of guys. These were two different interviews, and I, I had a longer interview with Dr. Sims than I did with Dr. Demergian, so this might feel a little bit lopsided, but these guys are collaborators and huge fans of one another's work, so I don't think either of them will have a problem with that. In all cases, we're going to be talking about how orthodontic appliances, something kind of like the mouth guard that you might get after you've gotten your braces taken off, kind of thing that a person might wear during their sleep, how something similar to that can actually be used in some cases to try treat neurological conditions that apparently counterintuitively sometimes have their origin of just an irritation of a nerve in the jaw. As I said, I got excited about this idea when I heard Professor Vince Clark, who was on an earlier episode, excited about this idea. He introduced me to the other doctors on email and, and quickly they sent across not just some research papers that their work was referencing, but also some video that they'd shot within their offices, which are, are really dramatic. We'll put these links up on the website so you can check these out. The disorder that we speak about the most in the interview that you're about to hear is Tourette's syndrome, which is probably 
probably the one that's best known to people, but quick little recap. Tourette's is something that can play out in a lot of different ways depending on the idiosyncrasies of a person's condition. It might be as relatively innocuous as blinking more than a person normally would and, and sort of uncontrollably swallowing fairly frequently, whereas in other people's cases, it can be kind of physically and socially crippling. One of the people that Dr. Sims treated in the video, you would see him kind of uh, not punching himself, but kind of uncontrollably raising his hand and giving himself a light smack in the forehead with, with a lot greater regularity than one would want to do that. But my point is, if you're listening to this while driving or something like that and don't have time to check out a video, which I, I completely understand, I want you to kind of mentally prime yourself for what you're about to hear by thinking of somebody with, with a really bad case of Tourette's syndrome. Someone who looks like they're in pain because the muscles of their face are involuntarily forced into these awkward, grimace-like expressions and making sounds semi-regularly that they can't control. And then later in the video, watching those symptoms drop away by, you know, 75 or 90 percent. It's really pretty dramatic. So let's start things off talking with Dr. Anthony Sims. About 11 years ago, back in 2004, 12 years ago, I went to a American Academy of Craniofacial Pain meeting in D.C. And this gentleman, uh, Dr. Brendan Stack, was speaking. And he had some very good videos of patients who actually had neurological problems. And, you know, most of the doctors there were like, very good doctor, very good. But me, I was hook, line, and sinker. I had to know what he did how he did it, what was the mechanism, everything. And that's what got me started on this pathway. And then uh, I became good friends with him and I had to learn all the mechanisms for what the oral facial cavity can do and the craniofacial problems can do and what can a dentist do to actually relieve some of these problems. And that's how I got started. Yeah, no, it, it's, it just sounds like an amazing uh, career transition. You don't go into dentistry thinking that you're going to be able to address problems like these. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I had no clue at that time that it was going to be such a life changing move on my part. Yeah. So, so tell me, I mean, how much of your practice now s still is in traditional dentistry versus what you're sort of now becoming known for of dealing with these neurological conditions? Probably about 50% right now yeah. is general dentistry. But I have gotten people from literally all over the world, people from Japan, people from Canada, people from Norway, people from England coming to see me because they have run out of options. And uh, a lot of them uh, were told, this is the way you're going to be for the rest of your life. And then they see some of the uh, videos that I had sent you of other patients and how they have overcome their maladies. And they were hoping that I would be able to help their situations. Can, can you tell us a little about the range of disorders that you've been able to have effects on so far? The different disorders, let me start from the beginning. The first one that I actually got to treat was a patient who had severe Tourette syndrome. I was asked if this treatment would work for someone with Tourette's by a pastoral friend of mine. And if you had asked me 12 years ago what Tourette's was, it was way over my head, way, way over my head. I wouldn't have known what what to do or what to say. So I brought this gentleman in and he had one of the most severe cases that you've ever seen. And uh we decided to test him out. It was a Friday afternoon, tested him out, and literally all of his tics stopped. And I was just as surprised as he was. So then I couldn't just go to any physician and say, look what we can do. You have to know the mechanism. Right. You can't just say, look at this, look at this. You have to know the mechanism. And that's what took me down this pathway of studying. I mean, literally for almost a year and a half, I went to the University of Maryland Medical Library just about every day after work and tried to find where this mechanism was. And according to the normal way of thinking, they kept saying it's in the basal ganglia, in the basal ganglia, in the basal ganglia. And for six months, I'm looking for something in the basal ganglia and nothing worked. So my friend said to me, he said, what is the definition of madness? Doing the same thing the same way, expecting a different result. We looked at the basal ganglia inside out, upside down and couldn't find it. The thing was, try someplace else. And then I decided, well, what is my nerve, the nerve that I work with, which is actually the trigeminal nerve. And therefore, I started looking at the trigeminal nerve. 
And the amount of connections that the trigeminal nerve actually has, it is unbelievable. And where, where does this nerve run, just so people can kind of imagine this, you know, in their own skull, in their own face? Where are we talking here? It is in the cranium. There are three branches. There's an ophthalmic division, a maxillary division, and a mandibular division. And they run into a junction box called the Gasserian ganglion. And then they run into the spinal cord to another area called the, there are different nuclei where all the nerve, the different fibers come together. And then it actually goes to a multitude of different areas. It goes to the cerebellum, goes to the thalamus, goes to the vestibular nuclei, which controls your balance, goes to the, also the cerebellum controls your balance. It goes to the um, hippocampus, uh, which controls memory. It goes to the hypothalamus, which, which controls sleep. It goes down the spinal cord. And the main one that no one really thinks about is called the reticular formation. The reticular formation is basically the centerpiece inside the spinal cord and runs along the, uh, the brainstem. It is the only cranial nerve that has direct input into that area. And with the reticular formation, that controls all your autonomic movements, such as blinking such as walking, such as sneezing, coughing, breathing, heart rate, all these different things, it actually controls. I've kept patients coming in all the time. They go, oh, by the way, these symptoms have nothing to do with my TMJ. But as I go through the symptoms and I start doing the evaluation, as I start correcting the jaw position, all of a sudden their eyes get big. They go, wow, I'm feeling improvement in other things that I didn't think I had. That's why Dr. Simpson, myself, I just keep my ears open as a patient comes in when they say I have this symptom or that symptom. My goal is to see if I can do something to their jaw to affect that symptom as well. If there is a bad signal coming from the trigeminal nerve into reticular formation, now you have a bad signal in the reticular formation, it can create havoc in those different areas, such as balance, such as walking, such as blinking, such as heart rate, all these different things. So, so let me let me break this down and repeat back what I, what I think I just heard. So it, it sounds like a lot of these neurological disorders are actually the midbrain taking orders from the jaw area when probably these signals should just be generated completely endogenously within the brain. That's right. Let's let's just take Tourette's syndrome, for instance. OK, I tell all my parents, I say, you think about a sneeze. The sneeze is an irritation of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. One of the things that you have to do when you sneeze is you have to blink. Now, everybody's going to try and do that just by me talking about that. They're going to try and sneeze and not blink, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay? Now, with Tourette's syndrome, the first sign is usually a lot of blinking. Another sign with the sneeze is you make a facial grimace. With Tourette's syndrome, you make a facial grimace. Wow, that's true, isn't it? Third sign, you, you shake your head in a sneeze. In Tourette's syndrome, many of them shake their heads. Fourth sign, they shake their shoulders when you sneeze because you're want, you're, your body is trying to get rid of something. So your shoulders shake. Same thing with Tourette's syndrome. Fifth sign, with a sneeze, you always make a sound. With Tourette's syndrome, you always make a sound. Sixth sign, with a sneeze, you know it's coming. With Tourette's syndrome, they call it a premonitory urge. That means you know it's coming. Once the tick happens, you're relieved. Once you sneeze, you're relieved. So Tourette's is almost like a, a slow motion, prolonged sneeze. Most of the time, it's just from a different portion of the trigeminal nerve. The sneeze is from the ophthalmic division. 90% of Tourette's syndrome is from the mandibular division of the same nerve. Now, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. That's fascinating. So what what is it that's going wrong with people that have something like Tourette's syndrome that's causing these signals to come in? In my opinion, there are several causes. What we need to do is rule out if this is one of the causes and if I can correct the child or the adult's jaw position and their tick starts settling down, then we do know that this is one of the things that are contributing. Tourette's syndrome is a craniofacial growth problem. Tourette's syndrome comes about usually around the age of five, six, seven, eight, or nine, okay? 
what happens at five, six, seven, eight, or nine? You, you get your adult teeth, right? Well, that's one. That's very good, though. Very good. But you're growing. You always send your kid out during the summertime, and they come back, and they're three inches taller. They grow so fast. What happens with Tourette's is that one of the jaws is growing faster than the other jaw. So you have an irritation of that nerve. Now, sometimes it catches up with no problem. Sometimes it doesn't. That's when you get the Tourette syndrome. Watching these videos, the results uh, really are shocking. It's results that are so good, it kind of reminds you of like a preacher laying on hands and you know, somebody <laughs> jumping up out of a wheelchair. And it just it kind of makes you think, well, that can't possibly be true. Or if, if it is true, how come this isn't instantly realized as being like the way to treat these concerns? I mean, you became aware of this, you said, in a, around 2004. So, I mean, we're, we're talking you know, over a decade now. How is this catching on as far as sort of a, a standard of care for treatment for some of these? problems. It's still not considered standard of care. A lot of times it's difficult to change minds. It's because we don't have the hardcore evidence, the science behind it published yet. And I say yet because I am working with a research group out of UCLA, two professors. Currently, we've got a couple of cases, actually one that we even did brain scans on a CRPS patient, complex regional pain syndrome. We did a brain scan, MRI, functional MRI actually, with and without the mouthpiece. And it shows different parts of the brain lighting up. And when she had the mouthpiece in, her brain activity was exactly the same as a normal person. We were able to eliminate the parts of the brain that were firing when she was having the pain. So as we do more of that hardcore evidence, eventually the medical community will come around because now we've got the hard science backing up what we're doing. The way things have been taught for decades, it's hard to change someone's perception of what can be done. And uh, that's why you see a lot of the videos, uh, because if I didn't put the videos out, it would be very difficult for people to believe me when I say we can do what we do. My method, I get anywhere between 85 to 100 percent success rate with medication. And this is not my numbers. This is the numbers that are put out there by the pharmaceutical companies is only about 30 percent correction. And mine has no side effects because there is no drugs and there is no surgery. Most of the time, we can see the results pretty quickly, but it doesn't help everybody. I've had many cases where I will test and try to change their job position, and I don't see any changes in their neurologic condition. So those are the patients I tell them, you know what, it's not going to help you. And the nice thing is with what we're doing, it's non-invasive, it doesn't have anything to do with medications, and it's very reversible. So if somebody says, you know what, I don't want to wear that mouthpiece anymore, they can take their mouthpiece out and stop. With the medications that are given, there is so many side effects. Kids gain weight, kids get depressed, kids have, with some medications, suicidal thoughts. And at, at five, six, and seven, eight, nine years old, you don't want that for your child. You want your child to grow and be a normal kid. So you, we mentioned Tourette's here, and that's probably, of the conditions mentioned, that's probably the one that will be familiar to most people, at least by name. But can you, can you tell us some of the other conditions that you've been able to treat with this approach? Absolutely. The reason I mentioned Tourette's is because what I did was, from those who had Tourette's, I looked at their symptoms and what they were doing. Like I was telling you earlier, one of the first things you have to do is you have to blink. What, if ha what would happen if you had a sustained irritation or compression of the nerve? The blink would close the person's eyes. And what, what, what we've done is we've looked at other patients and we found a what is called a dystonia, which is called blepharospasm. Blepharospasm is where the eye, they have what is called a functional blindness. The eye, the patient's eyes cannot open. But when we do the same thing in uh, helping those patients, their eyes actually open wide up. And it's, it's, it's been documented even before I knew it. It was in 2007. They actually have it in the Movement Disorder Journal in which they put a mouth orthotic in and the patient's eyes opened up. So it was even before me. But the main way to go at this point in time is with Botox or eye surgery. Wow. 
how many people are there? How many people are affected by w- one of these um, clusters of conditions that, that you think might be treatable with a, a mouth orthotic like this? The number three most diagnosed malady in the United States is dystonia in which the the neck or the head is twisted to one side. And there are other types of dystonia. I mentioned blepharospasm, which, which is also a dystonia. You have dystonic posturing, which people almost look like they're cramped up. And, and that is a uh, hemiplegic type of dystonia. And with many of these maladies, it can be helped or relieved with the oral appliance. And there is research that tells you, uh, um, and I'm talking about neuroanatomy research that will actually tell you and connect the dots to why this actually can happen. That's one of my main focuses is to know the research so that I can point out to my colleagues that this is not anything new. This is something that has been studied and researched by universities to show that the trigeminal nerve actually controls a lot of things, a lot. Now with orthodontics, uh, the orthodontic schools are now changing a little bit in their thinking, especially if you have to do extraction of teeth, because when you extract teeth, you close up the airway and you close up the airway, you have problems later on down the line, such as sleep apnea. So now they're thinking, well, this is a dynamic shift here. We have to think more expansion instead of extraction. So orthodontics is, and the orthodontic schools are starting to move forward in, in their thinking and not just trying to have straight teeth, but have a balanced face and a balanced craniofacial bones and jaws and, and airway so that we don't run into these problems later on in life. Okay, so I had you know braces when I was a kid, and I remember the process of going in and the orthodontist sizing up my teeth. When you're building an appliance to help people with some of these neurological conditions, what is the level of personalization to their own mouth, their own jaw? Once we do an exam, we get x-rays, we know what's happening with the jaw and what the, what the goal is for the jaw position. Sometimes it's one specific position. Sometimes because of how the muscles and the joints and the ligaments have been for years, what I tell my patients is I follow the changes and the unraveling of the joint and the muscles. And the example I'm going to give you is you're walking around with one shoe on and one shoe off, you're off kilter. And your muscles and joints and your body has adapted to that for months and years. Now, if I get in and put another shoe under your other foot, it's going to take some time for your muscles and hips and everything to start unraveling and going to balance. So some people, it's an immediate change. Some people, we have to follow the changes gradually and keep changing the mouthpiece, whether it's every month, every couple of months, fine-tuning the mouthpiece to continually see the improvements. I have I have them where it's during their waking hours of the day. Most of the time when they're sleeping, they don't need it, but there are certain disorders that I do. I want them to wear it at night also. It changes their perception and changes their lives. You can gain strength by utilizing it. Matter of fact, um, just a side note, Derek Jeter wears a, a mouth guard. He never played baseball without his mouth guard. Huh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It gave him better strength. So I I imagine there's probably like nationwide listings of Tourette's sufferers and and groups like that that allow people to communicate with one another that have these conditions. Are are these groups aware of the treatment that you're offering, that you're making available? The main society, the Tourette's Association of America, they know about us. They've contacted us and they are in the process of trying to do a double-blinded study on it. They know, they've known for a while, but it, it takes time to change people's mind. But Tourette's is just a, literally, it is the tip of the iceberg. There are, there are so many other disorders that we can help relieve the patients of. There's dystonia. There is complex regional pain syndrome. There are certain gait disorders or walking disorders. There, there are sleep disorders that can be affected with what we do. And with sleep disorders, they've come out and told you that there is Alzheimer's associated with it. Dementia is associated with it. What should people maybe be clued into that might be a um, trigger that, that might make them suspect, hey, you know, maybe this is something that I should get looked at? 
if they've got any TMJ issues, common symptoms, headaches, neck pain, jaw, if they've got clicking or popping, as they open, if their jaw is shifting in a certain position, uh, if it's not opening straight up and down, if they have limited openings where when they open, their jaw opens to a certain amount and it stops, a uh, simple test is to see how many fingers they can put in their mouth. If they can only put two or three fingers in their mouth, they've got a limitation in their opening. Well, that's interesting. That that hits close to home for me. I've always been able to cause a popping in the right side of my jaw. I mean, I could do it right now if I wanted to. It's not something that causes me any pain. I, I wonder if that's something that might cause problems down the road. Oh. In your case, if you don't have any other symptoms, I would just keep an eye on it. A lot of these cases that we see with the neurologic cases, they've had constant or many traumatic injuries as they've been growing up or sports or something where they've had flips or falls or injuries that as a child or in their teens that, and those injuries over time add up. Sleep disorders can be helped with the appliances that we use. They did this in, I think, in San Diego, and I think they did it in Finland also, in which they used a, a CPAP machine to see if memory was increased, and it did. What is a CPAP? Continuous. Oh, oh continuous. yeah, continuous pressure. This is for people that have um, sleep apnea, and it's holding, holding yeah. their uh, positive air pressure to help them breathe. Yes. The number one way of doing it in the other countries is with an oral appliance not the CPAP, and it will do the, have the same effect as the CPAP. Yeah, and that, that can be huge for, uh, for quality of sleep, which allows the beta amyloid plaques to flow out of the brain better, which, of mm. course, helps to uh, alleviate Alzheimer's or keep Alzheimer's from happening in the first place. There you go. Yeah, wow. Your, your body's made to have 32 teeth, but if you cut it down to 24, you start squeezing stuff. You're putting pressure on nerves and bones that weren't meant to have pressure. When we are from ages 1 to 30, 35, 40, everything is going outward. After age 40, everything starts to slow down and we start shrinking. It's growth hormone to make everything bigger, better, less pressure on the nerves. When we start putting pressure on nerves is when stuff collapses. And that's when, as we get older, we start having all these problems, these maladies come about. And so it, it's a matter of knowing that growth hormone the body is producing to help us have a better balanced face, better balanced craniofacial structure. And there are there are there are some some doctors out there that are starting to think that way. So w when I see like an older person sort of shuffling down the street, not having good posture, you know, whatever it is, I guess my, my default assumption is, well, maybe their muscles aren't as strong. Maybe they're starting to have weaker bones and, and that's accounting for some of these things. But is it is it fair in light of what we're talking about here to assume that some of these changes in gait and posture that take place with old age are, are really based on having additional pressure w within their jaws and mandibles? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you notice, as a person gets older, one of the things that happens is they they naturally flatten out their teeth. So what happens is they lose what is called vertical dimension or, or vertical height of their jaws. When you lose vertical height of your jaws, your jaw actually starts to impinge on one of those specific nerves, which causes gait problems, which causes balance problems, which causes patients to start shuffling. You see them, the older people, they start leaning forward. Why do they lean forward? Because they've lost vertical height. When you lose vertical height, the natural pull of your, of your muscles is upward and backward. So if you're pulling your jaw upward and backward, what does that do to your airway? It closes the airway. In order for the elderly to get more air, they have to push their jaw forward. So they lean forward. They lean their heads forward. They call it forward head posture. So now they can get more air. So as they grind their teeth, naturally grind, 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 they naturally pull their heads forward, 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 so that they can breathe. And this is nothing unnatural. It's just wear and tear with old age. Yes. We think of orthodonture as being something that typically is for uh, preteens and teenagers. And then, of course, you know, maybe maybe getting a false set of teeth put in when you're older. But it, I'm wondering if I'm you know, in my late 50s and I notice that my posture is starting to change or my, my walking gait is starting to change. At what point might it be worth a check in with somebody like you to see if there's a um, dental way of addressing that issue? I, I would say if you're having even the slightest thought or doubt, 
I would have a checkup with with someone who does the certain the same type of things that I do. The tests are simple enough to do, and you can see pretty much whether or not it's going to work for that person or not. Is is this treatment covered by typical insurance policies that people might have? If I if I have you know diagnosed Tourette's, could I come to you and get that covered, or is this sort of outside the normal standard of care, and so insurance won't right. won't handle it? The insurance won't do it. Yeah. They won't do it. And that's pro- possibly one of the reasons why people don't go and try it out. How many dentists are there across the country that are trained in this sort of thing, that, that know how to do what you know how to do? Uh, very few. Myself and Dr. Demergian, and there are a few who dibble and dabble in between here and there. But Dr. Demergian and, and myself, we do a lot of it. We, you know, there are some in England that do the same thing and uh, they're getting the same success rate. You said 85 to 90 percent is about where you're at. 80, 85 to 90 percent. And I'm and I'm talking about all the symptoms, not just one or two, but yeah. all the symptoms. And, and how, how, how big is that sample size? How many people have you have you treated? Oh, I've I've done hundred or two. And I've been doing it since consistently. I've been doing it since 2006. Is the cost of treatment for one of these orthodontic appliances, is it similar to what it would be to get braces or, or, or something like that? It's half the cost of braces. Uh, you, never see, you never see me in any of the videos because I want people to tell their story and let them talk to you and tell you how well they're doing. They have Tourette's, they have dystonia, they have uh, walking gait problems, functional blindness, complex regional pain syndrome. In many cases, it can be helped or relieved because this is what medicine is supposed to be. You're supposed to never be stuck. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Dr. Anthony Sims and Dr. Gary Demergian for taking the time for those respective interviews. Needless to say, this is one of those episodes that doesn't necessarily have a huge amount of action ability for most of us listening, probably. But for the listeners that do have a relevant condition or maybe know somebody in a family or extended network that suffers from one of these type of conditions, I just thought this was a, a very worthwhile idea to sort of seed out there and let people know that the possibility for an alternative type of treatment like this is something that exists. And luckily, it sounds like is, is something that's being being studied pretty seriously now, so it could conceivably become a part of sort of the mainstream medical response to these conditions sometime in the not distant future. But really cool to get to talk with some of the trailblazers that are testing out some of these new treatment methodologies. But now, as promised, let's switch topics with a bit of distraction into the ruthless listener retention gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So I remember going into, I, th- I think this was in Santa Monica, California, a high-end animation studio, probably about 10 years ago, and there were a bunch of cubicles, but inside them they had just tricked out computers. So like, you know, the really nice 30-inch flat screens, back when that was even a, more of a rarity than it is now. These guys were designing special effects, and they would have, you know, Star Wars toys and dinosaurs and stuff like that. Just a whole lot of toy geekery going on. And I, I remember thinking at the time, well, it's cool that they let these people have such a creative creative environment, the bosses must have decided that either the creativity uptick or the overall morale benefits to letting people customize their own environment must be outweighing what a distraction it is to have these toys all over the place all the time. But according to recent work by researchers at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I was entirely wrong because... Those sorts of distractions, distractions though they may be in the technical sense, can actually allow people to focus better. Research studies are showing something which actually when you think about it intuitively, it kind of does seem true that the emotional valence, as they call it, whether something is sort of positive or negative of a distraction makes a giant difference as to whether the distraction causes us to lose focus on whatever it is that we are trying to focus on before the distraction occurred. So let's say you're trying to, you know, memorize your, your next 30 digits of pi or whatever it is. And then you realize that the neighbor's dog is snuck in your back door and is about to pee on your kitchen floor. That kind of a negatively affected distraction is a lot more likely to make you lose those decimals of pi that you're trying to remember than if you get a positive distraction, like you notice a a beautiful monarch butterfly landing on your windowsill. You may very well be able to notice and appreciate the butterfly and also still have all those digits intact. According to Alexandru Jordan, whose work was published recently in Cerebral Cortex, their findings indicate that both positive and negative distracting images affect the brain, but that the positive distractions are actually linked with increased performance in working memory compared to negative distraction, which of course decrements working memory. The main result of our studies is that the positive distractions do not interfere with working memory performance. In fact, they actually help compared to the negative distractions, even though they may produce equally intense emotional responses. 
The way that the researchers studied this is that they showed people a whole lot of human faces and then they would be asked whether they had seen a specific face among that group or not. But during the delay between when they were shown the faces and when they were asked, they were shown a mixture of other images which might have been positive, neutral, or negative. What's going on within the brain when these interactions are taking place between working memory and attention? There's a couple of key areas involved called the dorsolateral prefrontal and the lateral parietal cortices. According to Jordan, these areas stay in tune with each other when we try to keep information active in our mind. Negative distractions strongly reduced activity in these regions. However, positive distractions had much less impact on the activity, while there was increased activity in the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, an area associated with emotional control. This may explain why we perform better under positive distraction, because positive distractions have less detrimental effects in the brain areas involved in the ability to stay focused, while at the same time they increase activity in the areas that are helping us to cope with the distraction. Now, I can't say that this is the most actionable piece of neuroscience news that we've ever heard because probably the takeaway is, hey, if you're going to be distracted anyway, you might as well make it a positive distraction. But I don't think any of us would be electing to have negative distractions in our lives if that was something that we had control over anyway. So there's probably not much that we can do that we're not doing already to avoid negative distractions. But if your intuition, like mine had been, was that even positive distractions would probably be a hindrance to something like working memory, you can cast those ideas aside because apparently it just ain't so. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode at number 112. You can find all the things about this episode online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 112, including the links to everything we talked about here. If you enjoyed this episode, I would humbly request that you tell a couple of friends about Smart Drug Smarts. Keep our family tree of listeners growing. You can do that on social media, do that in real life, do that on iTunes, do that on any platform of your choice. Google has got a podcast player coming out now too, so it may be that iTunes, the 800-pound gorilla of the podcast distribution world, is going to be getting a little significant competition, but however you choose to listen, we are glad that you're doing so. We've got some great episodes coming up in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be having somebody that's running an at-home, placebo-controlled study on your own response to different nootropics. We're going to be talking with somebody from the Future of Humanity Institute. Got an episode coming up about cannabidiol, the lesser known, but probably equally interesting chemical cousin of THC that's inside the marijuana plant and a whole lot more. So look forward to seeing you in the next couple of weeks. As for next week, I'll be back at you next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine tune the performance of your own brain. So have a great week until then and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.